Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel presentation, and thank you for joining us. We are very excited about today's discussion. So we're just going to go ahead. I will be introducing our panelists. But in the meantime, if you have any questions for them as we're going along our discussion, please uh, submit those in our Q&A box. And uh, hopefully, we will be able to answer those questions within the time frame we have for today's event. So I uh, want to introduce our first panelist, who is Mark Aston, representing our social work program. And then we have Phyllis Bunch. Phyllis is actually a double Texan, having earned both a master's in music education and this August, she will be graduating with her doctoral degree in educational leadership. And she successfully defended her dissertation recently. And so now we can officially call her Dr. Bunch. Um, but we will be uh, moving forward with our presentation. I want to ask them to just tell us a little bit about uh, themselves. And um, Mark, if we could start with you, please. Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Mark Aston. Um, I'm originally from Abilene, Texas. Um, I am a double alum here. I uh, got my bachelor's degree uh, from Tarleton in the social work program and uh, my master's in the social work program here. Um, currently for work, I work at Tarleton in the student counseling uh, center. I am a survivor advocate and alcohol and other drug coordinator. Um, and I do see um, some clients. I have a small caseload for clinical work as well um, as I'm working for my ma um, my licensed clinical social worker uh, licensure. Uh, so far, it's family life. Um, I I have a blended family. Um, I have two of my own children. My wife has two children, um, 18, 16, 16, and 14. So our hands are full. Um, and... Um, we just like to hang out here and enjoy uh, North Texas. Thank you, Phyllis. Well, my name is uh, now Dr. Phyllis Bunch as of last Wednesday. And I am like uh, Dr. Hickpoo said, I'm a double alum. I graduated uh, in August of 2017 with my master's of music education. And uh, I will walk this August with my doctorate in educational leadership. Um, I, uh, I, what I were you doing before, before you started grad school? Oh, well, I started grad school while I was being a music educator in Alito, Texas. I have uh, my bachelor's degree is from Midwestern State University in music education and humanities. And so I was a music teacher and band director. And then I started my, uh, my master's degree while I was at Alito ISD outside of Fort Worth. And it was totally online. And then I uh, began this doctorate uh, three years ago where I've been the doctoral research fellow, one of two. Um, our fellowship uh, allowed us to do international and national and state presentations. And we've been uh, done a lot, of, a lot of scholarly articles and such. So it's been great. I've got five children and one brand new grandbaby. And we like to go camping and just hang out in the heat in North Texas. <laughs> well, tell us why you wanted to pursue graduate school and ultimately why you chose to attend Tarleton. So I decided uh, to pursue a graduate, graduate degree because of my ultimate goal. Um, I should have probably included this in the, my background, but uh, I was a police officer in Arizona. I got medically retired and I'm originally from Texas. So I moved back to Texas um, after I got married and I needed something to do because I was fairly young and retired. So um, my wife has a um, her own practice, uh, social work practice for clinical social work um, in Granbury. Uh, so I decided that I would like to pursue a career in counseling as well. Um, and in order to do private practice, you need um, a licensed clinical social worker license, which um, you have to get your master's first. 
So that's that's ultimately why I decided to pursue a graduate degree. I chose Tarleton, um, number one, because I was a non-traditional student. Um, and I really, really liked the faculty. I got to know the faculty in the social work program. Um, and several of the professors that I had, or at least one um, that I had in the bachelor's program, moved up to the master's program. Um, but ultimately, it was really convenient for me. I live in Granbury. Um, and like I said, I got a job here at uh, student counseling. So it just kind of worked out for me to choose Tarleton. Thank you, Phyllis. Well, I um, wanted to pursue my master's of music education for one, because it helps it helps when you're in public ed to have a master's degree, <laughs> uh, especially in a, a field like music. It's a very competitive field. Um, so the, the higher your degree, the better. Um, and I chose the doctorate. I was, I was gifted the doctorate. So, um, one of the, I was helping, uh, with grad studies things and, um, one of the people over in the college of grad studies said, Hey, why don't you just keep on going and come do our doctorate? I chose Tarleton for my master's degree because it was totally online and I was working full time and had children at home. And, um, so it just worked better in my, in my world. Um, for the doctorate, I had, uh, left teaching and, you know, God opens doors. And so I, uh, I had looked at a doctorate in music ed online, and I really decided that I needed to be in a face-to-face -face program, and Tarleton offers a face-to-face -face program for your doctorate in educational leadership, and it just, it just played out. It was great, and we bleed purple in my house. Thank you. So, uh, Mark, you talked about the faculty. Can you, you both tell us about faculty interactions, especially if you're in a fully uh, online program? What does that actually look like? Well, uh, when I was attending grad school, it was a hybrid. Um, we did do in-person and then um, had um, certain components that were, were online. Um, my interactions with faculty were, were always positive. Um, they're very approachable. I know in our social work program, very approachable, office hours, phone calls, emails. Um, um, they might not get back to you right away if it's after hours or outside of class time, but um, you could always um, expect a response um, and communication with, with the faculty. And they were really, really good at that. It was the same with me, um, with my totally online uh, program. The discussion boards were great. Um, they would, uh, all of the fact, all of the music faculty are just so involved. And we would set up times to meet. It was wonderful to come across everybody in the, I guess it was like a cohort we went through together. Uh, even though we were online and anyone who was in Texas who was a music educator, we would meet up and meet with the faculty every year at the Texas Music Educators Convention in San Antonio. So that was awesome. Um, they were also supportive and so much so that one of my master's level faculty members was on my dissertation committee for my doctorate um, in the EDD program. The faculty, there are very few faculty. Um, they are very open. They, you end up with their cell phone numbers. Um, they're very responsive and it really does turn into a family. Mm -hmm. it, it's wonderful. You mentioned your classmates. What type of opportunity is there to, to interact with, with classmates if you're fully online? Well, we would just meet up. Um, there were several of us that lived in close proximity. And so I work better in person and I work uh, group group work for me is better in person. Uh, so it just so happened that I ended up on groups with uh, other members of our, our little cohort that were 
close so I could meet up at the library or the coffee shop or whatever with them. But we always made it a point to meet up at TMEA also. Um, it was wonderful. We didn't get to meet everyone. We had people from overseas. Uh, one person in our cohort was from Korea and we had people from other states, but we would get online and, and Zoom with them before Zooming was cool. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us uh, what qualities do you think make for a successful graduate student? Who? Um, so one big quality I think um, would be being able to manage your time uh, because a lot of people that are in grad school are non-traditional. They're older, um, like myself, um, have families, um, have jobs. Um, so there's a lot of juggling outside um, obligations with, with your schoolwork and, um, being able to prioritize, um, schoolwork, um, having those planners. I'm a big, I'm a big planner guy. So, you know, you have your planner with everything that you can look for the week, uh, being able to do that and kind of triage what needs to be done immediately as opposed to what can be kind of pushed off a little bit, you know, the prioritizing. Um, and then also, Taking time for self-care, that is super important because um, there were several times um, in grad school where I was getting overwhelmed and, you know, you have to take that time out to take care of yourself mentally and then you can get right back into it. And that that is um, very, very important. Thank you. I, I agree with Mark um, wholeheartedly <laughs> that being organized um, and, and that looks different to other people. I have a different organizational system than my partner in crime here, Jesse. Um, but being organized and having stick to itiveness, mm -hmm. you know, just sticking to it. You've got to eat that elephant one bite at a time. And really what helped me was a, a good support system. Um, and that could be in your family. It could be a friend and, and definitely your professors. Uh, but uh, establishing some, some good supports and some good boundaries and, and the time management is, is a great, great quality that will make for a successful graduate student. Fantastic. So, you know, one question I get asked a lot is uh, from people who've been out of school 5, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years, um, what advice would you give to those people who've been away from school a long time and are nervous or anxious about how they will perform? I can speak to that. Um, so as someone who was away from school for several years, um, I attended college the first time around in uh, the mid nineties, um, didn't do so well. And um, so I started career, you know, um, I went to the military and then I had a law enforcement career for 15 years. Um, but coming back, um, I was very intimidated. Um, and so reaching out, um, being, um, being okay with reaching out to your professors um, is something um, that I would encourage. I was kind of apprehensive to do that um, coming coming back to school um, in my 40s, uh, being around a very young cohort and everything. Um, but I would also um, I would also say kind of immerse yourself if you can in in the traditions um, here at Tarleton. Um, and get involved as much as you can outside of, you know, your regular duties with school and work and family. Um, I missed out on a lot of that and I wish I hadn't. Um, and I really wish I would have kind of embraced uh, more of the traditions and been okay with that. Well, and Mark, when you say reach out to faculty in what sense, if, if you're struggling? In any aspect, right? Struggling. I, um, uh, I, would not reach out um, at first and then um, just kind of be really anxious and have a lot of anxiety over things that once I ask questions in class or um, with my professors on a discussion board or, or whatever, um, and it would be a really easy response and I'd be like, okay, so they're here to help me. Uh, they don't want you to fail. They want you to succeed and they do 
just about everything in our power to help you succeed. So um, if you're struggling, if you have questions, reach out. That's, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. I agree. Um, establishing that relationship with your professors is, is key. Um, I, I always told my children, you know, if you go in and they know you, then you get the benefit of the doubt most of the time. So establishing an, a relationship uh, is is a good, good thing. I was away for a long time. I went to my first round was in the 80s. And then when I went back, I had to be a member of the marching band at 36 with five children. So um, you can do it. I graduated when I was 40 from my undergraduate degree. So uh, just establishing those relationships and become very familiar with whatever format you're going to be using for writing. Every, every mm -hmm. class is going to have a writing element. And if you become an expert in that format, for us, it's APA. The seventh edition book is your friend. Don't think you can find it online. You know, um, just get, get your resources and have them to where you can, you can pick it up and look at it, um, especially if you're a little bit older or non-traditional. Um, that that having that book there is is a great thing uh, to give you confidence. And when does that happen, Phyllis? That's something you would do when you start classes. You'll just you know I, make time to to read that on the side. Well, um, luckily the new one is tabbed, which is great. <laughs> so um, I. You just have it sitting with you when you're doing your work, you know, and then if you have a question, you can go to the index or go to the tabs. The tabs are great in APA 7. I don't know anything at all about um, Chicago or MLA, but if your program uses those books, just get it and thumb through it. I mean, we all have downtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're watching a show, you've got a commercial that's five minute break. So just like I would tell my students when they were practicing their flute, you can do a full 30 minutes of practice in a one hour TV show at night. If you just have it sitting there ready and during the commercial, mute it and get to work. Um, so you can make time for things. All right. Heard it here first. <laughs> um, tell us what a typical day was like for you as a, a graduate student. And if you can kind of give us um, maybe the difference between a weekday versus a weekend. When would you wake up? What would you do during the day? When would you study? When would you write? Uh, give us give us the, uh, the details. Uh, the details. So... Um... Being employed here, uh, my day starts at 8, um, so I would have to wake up at 6 to get ready to come to work. So 8 to 5, um, I'm working. Um, if I had downtime in between, say, lunch or um, a few minutes here and there, I could squeeze in a little bit of, um, of reading or study. Um, but my typical weekday would be come to work, go home, eat, and then write to write my papers, reading my assignments, um, and just hitting that. Um, I'm a, I'm a classic, um, I don't know if it's a good thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. So like I will sit down and do it, which is not always a good thing until I get extremely tired. Um, so some of those nights would be depending on the assignment or, um, how well I triaged my responsibilities. Um, could go midnight, one o'clock, wake up, do it again. Um, luckily, I had a really supportive wife. Um, so weekends, if we had plans and I could squeeze it in, um, do do some family stuff. Um, but generally, I carved out a big chunk of time um, on the weekends, whether it be early in the morning or six to, to nine at night, for, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Um to do the other stuff that I needed to do with school um, or assignments. And that would vary based on, you know, how uh, the page count of, of whatever assignment that I was working on. Um, but that was basically my typical day. 
Thank you. So in my master's program, I had typical days like that. In the doctoral program, it was atypical. Um, so uh, in my master's program, I taught school, elementary school. I would be there at 7. I would leave at 4.30 or 5, get home, make dinner, and read read a little, you know, um, most of my assignments were pretty large papers in that degree. We didn't have, you know, a, a one page assignment <laughs> do ever. Um, they were usually, uh, six to 10 page papers. Um, I really did most of it on, I would read a little bit during the week and then on Sunday, I would sit down and write. So I would get up, have breakfast, do our Sunday morning routine, church, come back, eat lunch. And then it was my time in my room. And I have to have it totally silent to write, um, to do anything. And so my husband would have Sunday afternoons for three years with the kids. And it was great time for them and good time for me to not have to worry about anything. And he did dinner and it was wonderful. Now with my doctorate as a fellow, I was in a fellowship. So I worked 20 hours a week for the university and I did research. And some of that research was also my own personal research. So I got to do, I got to intermingle everything um, during the day. So I would do my assignments and read and write and study and all of those things uh, all day every day <laughs> for three years. Thank you. And I'm not. All kidding. right. Um, there are many people who have no concept of what it means to take an online course or be enrolled in a fully online graduate program. So could you talk about what that actually looks like? How is it that you can go to school fully online? What exactly are you doing? What exactly is happening? So I didn't go fully online, but I can speak to taking classes. Um, our electives during the summers um, in grad school, we had to take two electives and they were fully online. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm old school. Uh, I'm a, like Dr. Bunch. I like to be in class, um, front row. Um, I'm, I'm that person. So um, it was difficult for me um, to technology, not so much. I, I get the technology. It's just um, being able to, um, it was harder for me to prioritize online than in person, mm -hmm. uh, because it was easy to forget, um, and kind of put it out of sight, out of mind. Oh, I don't have to be here or, um, I have this assignment. We're not meeting this week or whatever. And we have this to do this week. It, it was really easy for me to kind of just, Oh, I don't have it. Um, but, um, just prioritizing and being present and um, being able to, to keep track of it um, for me, just for the electives. Um, I, I don't know about Dr. Bunch being totally online for her masters, but she can speak to that. So uh, doing totally online, I started, uh, they have learning management systems that you use. So you'll go through the university and log on to, when I started, it was Blackboard. Now it's Canvas. Um, everything's there. They have calendars. They've got places where you can email through their application. Um, there's help buttons. There, there's, everything's available that you would need to be able to complete the program. I found the, um, the uh, calendar system was a, a lifesaver for me because we would have discussions. So instead of having interactions in the classroom where you ask questions or, or have discussion groups, they do them online and Typically, in both of my uh, graduate degrees here at Tarleton, they've had you have a discussion post that's, that you have to present. Um, you have to have it uploaded no later than Wednesday. 
And then you have to go in and you have to comment, meaningful comments, you know, no later than Saturday night on two or three other discussion posts. So that's how you get your interaction. Um, it was, it's all about just keeping your calendar up to date. Um, and if you can do that, then, then being online, it, it really is meaningful if you put the time and effort into the discussions because they do go back and forth. We have had people who would just post theirs and then go and do, you know, their required two comments and not really get in. But you, just like anything else in life, you get into an online program, uh, you get out of an online program what you put into an online program. So if you take the time and and make it make it your program, then um, it, it's very fulfilling and you you get just a lot of uh, good contacts and friends and, and and it's it's not hard. I know it looks like it would be hard uh, doing everything online, but but they've got all of these um, supports built in and and you can always go on to YouTube and say, hey, how do I do this on Canvas? And somebody out there knows more than you do and and they've posted it and they're making money from it. <laughs> it sounds like an ideal online student would need to be a self-starter. Yes. They would need to have those time management skills that, that Mark talked about at the beginning of our discussion. And then also you really need to be responsible for your learning. You need to be someone who's willing to, to really be an active learner. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. An another big concern that um, people have is, is how to balance everything. Uh, and of course, Tarleton has many non-traditional students in our graduate programs. If you're working full time, if you've got family obligations and you're also in graduate school, how do you balance everything? So if you can, can talk some more about that. And I know, um, you know, you mentioned the support that you got from spouses and, and family and that type of thing. But Mark, why, why don't you tell us um, some of uh, the, the things you did to help balance all your responsibilities? Yeah, um, so there are gonna be, you're gonna be doing a juggling match, you know, maybe um, like I was, uh, but um, relying on the support you have, uh, my wife, my family, my kids, everybody was very supportive of me. Um, but it kind of goes back to, uh, when I mentioned self-care, um, being a social worker, we talk about that a lot. Um, so, you know, you really do have to, to, um, take your, your mental health, uh, into consideration when you're going through this, um, and do take that time, um, whether it be five minutes to get up, go outside, um, take breath, do whatever, pet your dog. Um, whatever you can do, listen to a song, uh, but taking the time out for yourself. Um, but then also, um, we've talked about, you know, um, having the skills to kind of sit down and do what you need to do with school when you need to do it. Um, it is a delicate balancing match. Um, but, um, it's definitely doable, um, even with family and work. So, um, you're, it, it, the key is to find what works for you. Um, and you know, that's going to be like Dr. Bunch said earlier, it's going to be different for everybody. Um, uh, but finding that, finding your wheelhouse and just being, um, where you're comfortable and how you can juggle it. That's, that's the important thing. That's absolutely right, Mark. Also, um, remember that most of these graduate degrees are designed for working adults. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're the music Masters of Music Education is designed for people who are in the classroom being music educators. So the professors understand that the obligations, mm -hmm. you know, if you're coming through for a master's and you're going to do a superintendency program or, or a principal program, 
they understand that you are you're in the throes of doing the job. So um, they they have a whole lot of understanding and, and sometimes are, are a little more flexible and they understand that things come up that are out of our control. But mainly my biggest uh, way to balance everything was I had to set pretty firm boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would have my work time and then I, I have a 16 year old daughter that, that I have to force to have mommy daughter time because she's 16 and I need that, but she needs that too. She just doesn't know it. So, so you just have to make your boundaries and, and try to stick to them and, and understand that the, the professors have been where you are and they have an understanding of what you're going through. And, and most of these grad programs are made for working adults. I mean, that's, that's what they're geared towards. So. Thank you. All right. Last official question before we open things up to the audience. What do you wish you had known beforehand? Hmm. So many things. Um, let's see. The most important thing that I wish I would have known beforehand um, is that the, the the faculty and staff are they're they're not your friends, but they're here for you. Um, it's not a kind of us against them. They're not um, they're not here. Like I said earlier, to fail you, they want you to succeed. Um, and I just really wish I would have beforehand known somebody tell me, you know, you can talk to your professors um, and approach them, do this. Um, It'll be so much more beneficial and it'll cause you so much less stress. Um, Because if you just go to the source and ask a question, it's a lot easier than asking people in your cohort and be like, hey, did you get this? Because in my experience, we had a small cohort, uh, about eight of us, um, even from my undergrad that came to our our graduate, uh, graduate class. Um, and we knew each other, but the problem was um, we'd start talking amongst ourselves and come up with um, <laughs> what we thought we were supposed to do or what we needed to do. And somebody would ask, okay, I'm going to go ask. And they'd ask, and we all were wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, approach your professors. They're there for you. That's that's the, the main thing I would, I would say. I think I would – I thought about this all morning, and really – you know, when you're in the throes and it's monotonous and you're stressed out and you've got 15 assignments that you've got to do this semester, but you don't think that that's only one a week. Um, I guess I wish I would have known that you have time. You have time mm-hmm. to do this. You know, um, in the big picture of things, You know, these are just marking off little boxes, just one at a time, just, you know, nothing really is there to purposely derail you. (laughs) They aren't trying. It's not one of those instances where you get in and they say, look to your left and look to your right. And these people are not going to be with you. That's college is a business and they're in the business of educating students and they can't educate you if you don't if you're not retained. So they want you to persist and they're not trying to come out and derail your your education train. So um, I just kind of wish I would have had that more in the forefront that that we're all in this together. Like they're here to help me get through and and I'm not supposed to know everything. Because if I did, why would I need the program? Right. So, um, that those are the things that I wish I would have have known. Like day one it would have been way less stress, and I kind of wish I would have known Mark before today. <laughs> Aww, good people at Tarleton, mm-hmm. that's for sure. We're, we're a nice, nice, nice group of, of people. It's one question I meant to, to ask earlier um, is about paying for your graduate school education. Do you mind uh, sharing with us exactly how you paid for all of this? Because that's a a common concern 
um, with our prospective students, whether or not they even have the means to go to graduate school? Yeah, um, so absolutely. Um, the way I paid for uh, my undergrad and grad is uh, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. So in Texas, we have something that's called the Hazelwood Act um, that gives us, I believe it's up to a hundred and something credits, I think 150 maybe, um, of credits towards a state college, state funded college. Um, so that's how I got my funding. Obviously, they didn't cover books, um, but everything else was covered, um, uh, parking, decal, um, labs, tuition. Um, obviously, I didn't need room and board, but um, yeah, so I, I got paid for by the Hazelwood Act. Very nice. I was uh, fortunate to be the recipient of some really amazing scholarships. There are a lot of scholarships for graduate students. And right now we have grants too that are being funded. Um, I know that the cohort that started last week in the uh, Doctorate of Educational Leadership, they're receiving a $1,200 grant. I mean, it, each person, it's amazing. So uh, become familiar with Tarleton's um, uh, scholarship page. There are uh, there are hundreds of scholarships out there, and a lot of them are for graduate school. Mm -hmm. So that's how I paid for mine. Excellent, excellent. Yes, our Office of Scholarships has a very streamlined process. Um, students complete one general scholarship application form each school year, and then that allows them to be considered for any uh, graduate student scholarship awarded through Charlton. So it's a great, great system. You're automatically matched with any awards that you would qualify for. So that's, that's certainly a, an option as well. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to open things up to questions from the audience. Um, and you should see a Q&A box uh, that you can use to submit your questions. Um, and while we're waiting for those to come in, want to mention our various social media platforms. We certainly uh, invite you to join us there. Lots of great information for uh, prospective students uh, in addition to our, our, our overall graduate student community. And then um, if you're wanting to know how to contact the College of Graduate Studies, our information is here as well. Um, lots of great resources on our, our web page and then um, our, our phone number and email addresses. All right. Any questions from the audience? We'll wait a few seconds to see if any come in. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much, uh, Mark and Phyllis. You've been great representatives uh, for our Tarleton graduate programs. Congratulations, Dr. Bunch. So proud of you. And uh, Mark, we appreciate you. <laughs> hey. hey. Mark, we appreciate the good work that, that you're doing in our counseling center. Uh, a question. Uh, come up and it's an excellent question. What's the biggest difference you've noticed between undergraduate coursework and graduate coursework? Did, did you feel a difference, first of all? Hmm, I, I would say I did. Um, I don't wanna say undergraduate work is more busy work, but um, you really get immersed into your profession. Um, it's less generalist, especially speaking from a social work standpoint. Um, Graduating with a, a bachelor's in social work, it's more generalist perspective. Um, with the uh, graduate program here at Tarleton for social work, um, I went the individual family uh, and child practice um, route for um, for social work, which is a more clinical one-on-one -on -one, um, as opposed to the macro setting. So um, it's really more in depth. Um, you, you learn a lot more. Um, the coursework, there's a lot more writing, I would say. Um, Dr. Bunch kind of said that earlier. Um, you don't have that one two page paper essay. It's more of the six to 10 to 15. And that's not to scare you because you can do it. We, you know, we've done it, um, other people have done it. Um, but that, that would be the main um, difference, I would say. I agree with that. And um, we had, you're becoming an expert in your field. So that's that's one way to look at it. And so the 
sometimes you feel like it might be a little bit busy work. Like, why do I need to know this? Well, when you get down to that thesis or um, the couple hundred page dissertation, <laughs> um, yeah, you kind of did need that busy work that you did. You thought it was busy work uh, the second semester of, of your grad school. So uh, yeah, you be you're becoming an expert. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a viewer who is asking, what would you say was the toughest semester and what made it so tough? Ooh, um, there are, let's see. So I was in the um, advanced standing program. So we generally, we had fall, spring, and then two summer courses. Um, I would say for me, the toughest was the second semester um, because we had a capstone project that was due um, it's, it was in lieu of a, uh, of a thesis. Um, and that, I think my, my capstone ended up being roughly 90 pages long, but, but there's a big, but that was, um, everything that led up to that capstone was included. So all the courses, you know, we took stuff from each course and it, it, it was added to the capstone. So don't freak out over a 90 page paper because it, it all built up. But I would say that just the stress over the capstone paper that we had to do was probably the most stressful for me because you have to, you have to pass that capstone in order to graduate. So um, that, was, that was what it was for me. Well, and Mark, uh, your program has field placement requirements, right? Yes. So, yes. Internships. Yes. Yeah. So can you talk about your experience there and okay. balancing that with, with everything else? Yeah, so I was lucky. I was uh, when I say I was very, very lucky um, to get the, the placement that I got. Um, I interned here at uh, Student Counseling Services, um, and um, it just so happens I got hired um, and an, under a different job title. So I was able to use certain hours of my job, not everything, but certain hours of my job I could use towards my internship. Um, so that was a blessing in disguise. Um, so I didn't have to worry about getting hours past my my 40 hour work week, right? So it was built in. Um, and our internship program with uh, social work, um, especially for counseling, um, there's not a requirement for face-to-face -face hours. If you're at the agency, you get the internship hours. So um, it was a blessing for me because I was able to kind of just concurrently work and get those hours. But um, we did, um, I believe it was 250, 250 hours um, spring, 250 hours fall, which is totally doable. It's roughly about 18 hours a week, um, even if you don't have a job outside of, um, or if you do have a job outside of your internship um, and aren't able to, to work both. Um, but it is doable, um, so. Phyllis? Um, I, my hardest semesters were the ones that had our, our tests, you know, like the comprehensive exams, uh, in the music department, that was the second to the last semester. And in, uh, the ed doc, it was the second to the second to the last semester that I had to take. Uh, however, the ed doc has changed and they no longer have comprehensive exams. So I don't know what that will look like because I'm, I'm through. <laughs> Can you explain to people what exactly that is? Because many graduate programs do use comprehensive exams. So in my master's degree, the comprehensive exam um, consisted of five possible questions of which you had to answer four you're given a couple of hours, you have to go into a testing facility and um, the professors, it, we had five major professors in the music department in the Masters of Music Ed. Each of them got to ask one question. It could be from anything from the, from the entire program. So you had to adequately address their question. It turned into about a three to five page response for each of the questions. And you don't know, you prepare for five questions and you're asked four of those questions. So 
that's how it was in the master's program in the doctoral program it was basically the same thing we were asked questions about specific books that we had to read um, that we may have read in the first semester uh, it, it, they just it's a comprehensive comprehensive, a comprehensive exam. exam they can pull from anything that you've covered in your program, the whole yeah. program. yeah yeah thank you for that someone is asking is it uh worth it to involve yourself in graduate assistantships do do you all uh have any um familiarity with uh, ga positions i'm gonna defer to dr bunch because she looks like she has an answer and i, I, I don't i'm unfamiliar with that territory so so i'm in a fellowship position which is basically a ga position um we just get paid a little better <laughs> but, um yes i mean you, the networking mm -hmm. is amazing and you get to learn so much about the university in general and that you get a different relationship with your professors it's it's a really neat thing um my mm -hmm. position afforded me the opportunity to have the president of the university on my dissertation committee. And he tweeted about my dissertation following my successful defense last Wednesday. So yes, if you have, if you have the opportunity and, you know, financially you can do it and logistically you can do it, it is, it's something that is so worth it. And, it will it will pay itself back to you in spades. So, and for people who may be interested in those positions, um, I would first reach out to your academic departments and see um, what positions they have available. And uh, when it comes time to apply for those positions, all of those are posted in our uh, career services uh, job postings. Um, database. It's called Hire a Texan. And so everyone has access to those postings and, and can apply for them. Uh, some, some positions are actually teaching positions, but others are um, kind of traditional, almost work study type uh, jobs where you're actually working for the department, supporting them in, in various ways. So there are a lot of uh, great opportunities there um, if you can, if you have the time uh, to devote to that. Um, Mark, someone is asking about uh, field placement and internships. They wanted to know, did you get to pick the location um, uh, and were you given any help to find your placement? So both. Um, they do help you find placement positions. Um, if you have a place in mind, you can approach the, the field director um, and see if it's a good fit. Um, obviously, it has to fit um, the CSWE, which is a uh, Council on Social Work Education requirements for an internship. Um, and there are some pretty strict um, requirements for that. Um, you can't be uh, working there for 10 years and then have it fall in line to be an internship because you kind of already know what you're doing. Um, but yes, so yes, they will help you find internship positions. But if you have some place that you're really wanting to, to internship at, um, you can um, kind of petition the, the faculty and, and get some, some advice on that. All right. Uh, not seeing any other questions from the audience, I think we will end our webcast today. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. Again, you were wonderful representatives. Congratulations, Dr. Bunch. Thank and you. Uh, Mark, we appreciate what you do for our, our students and community in the, in the Counseling Center. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. You can uh, re-watch this uh, presentation on demand at your convenience. Um, just use the same link that you uh, use today to join us live. And uh, with that, I will end our webcast. Thanks, everybody.